lessons away. Great, so welcome everybody to this Open Ed SIG webinar. Uh, the Open Ed SIG, if you're not aware of us, was established in March 2012. We are supported by uh, the Association for Learning Technology, and uh, we have a space online, a community space online, which hopefully you've already discovered in order to join us today. The session that we've had, that link to the session is there, so let me just share that community space link. Uh, my name's Theresa McKinnon. I'm the co-chair of the Open Ed SIG. And I'm um, facilitating this conversation um, way outside of my comfort zone, really, but wanting to move the discussion forward. Great to see some more people joining us and some, uh, some really influential and great thinkers here who are going to join us for this conversation, because I think this is a very important conversation to have across all those organizations which use the word open. You can see a statement there on that first slide from the Open Ed SIG uh, that sort of identifies uh, our mission statement. Um, but the, the, the people who are joining us in the conversation today, very many of you are representing organizations which have the word open within their mission or their mission statement. Um, but you may be doing quite diverse and different things. Um, so really the point of today's session is to actually pull us together and to have a, a recorded, a captured discussion um, so that we can find out and surface some of the synergies that we share. And um, the Open Ed SIG role within this discussion really is just to facilitate it. We're not leading, we're just providing a space uh, where we're hoping uh, that, you, that we'll be able to get to know each other better and work together. And the reason I think that is so important is because the open message, although it may seem quite clear, it, it can actually be quite difficult to communicate to those outside of the open community, people who perhaps have never really thought much about what open means in the context maybe of education. Um, so this space that we're providing today really is an opportunity for us to share our different contexts and think a little bit about the synergies and the things that we share and uh, help really to sort of work towards a clearer message so that we can communicate um, what open means to those who are perhaps uh, watching from the sidelines or potentially interested uh, but not really quite sure exactly what um, what is involved in All Things Open. I can see some committee members have joined us. I can see some names and uh, uh, participants here from uh, OER, the very successful OER 17 conference. Uh, Josie Fraser was one of the co-chairs there. It's great to have you here, Josie. So, Chief, I see you've beaten your techno technological issues there and you've joined us, which is great. We have a fabulous response to the call to this discussion today uh, and a huge range of people from open data, from open source communities, from um, open access, uh, open education, lots and lots of different organizations doing slightly different things potentially but with that keyword open within their remit. So the session plan such as it is today is I've asked each of the participating organizations that came forward to put together just a quick slide. Um, so as your slide pops up, I'd be really grateful if you would grab the mic. Uh, you just need to hit the talk button underneath your image on the top left hand side and very, very briefly just give us um, a minute or so around who you are and what you do or the focus of your organization. I'm going to have to be really ruthless on the minute because we're going to have to uh, shoot through and uh, really listen to each other here. Um, but I would say that those organizations represented today in many cases have run more detailed webinars through the Open Ed SIG. Uh, so before I move on to that session, let me just share with you the um, Alt YouTube channel that we now have. So we have within the Association for Learning Technology, we now have an Open Ed SIG uh, 
um, YouTube channel, a playlist in effect, um, where we're sharing the recordings of previous um, alt webinars. So, for example, um, Geo for All, Suchi did a fabulous uh, webinar for us. We also had um, a webinar from Wikimedia. And these are more sort of detailed, one hour captured webinars and events with interaction. And you can watch these and catch up and see in a little bit more detail what different organizations do in this space. So we're going to have a quick introduction. Opportunities during that introduction, as many of you are taking advantage of now, which is great in the chat, to just network and connect, share links, share uh, Twitter profiles, tell us a bit about who you are and where you are. If you missed it and you've only just arrived, let me tell you that within this online room at the moment, we have people from across the world. So we have several venues in the States. We have Europe voluntarily covered too, um, the UK and all parts thereof covered as well with um, representation from Wales and Scotland. And uh, that's, that's looking good too. So great to have such an international cohort here coming together. Um, I, I, my background is in languages, so uh, when I was thinking about this session and talking to the um, Open Ed SIG committee around the session, um, I felt most comfortable to actually start this discussion from a sort of a, a linguist perspective, I suppose. Um, so to think about facilitating the discussion on the basis of how, uh, how we use language to express what open means to us and values. So I've got a couple of little activities that we're going to do during the session uh, that will follow after the um, initial introductions and sharing um, around our different participants uh, that are very language based. I think this may be just, well, I hope it will be just the start of an ongoing conversation. Um, so I, I've really no idea where we're going to go from here, but let's Let's find out. Let's find out. Um, I took inspiration a little bit from the Association for Learning Technology as well, which is really um, why I wanted to share this slide. So ALT, if you're not aware of ALT, um, have uh, recently um, relaunched their strategy document. It's a sort of an annual review, and it's been published. And that strategy also involved calling on the skills and expertise of Brian Mathers. And you can see here that they represented in a very visual, nice, easy to communicate way the things that alt value. And I was delighted to see openness in that collection um, of values. Uh, and I, I know from being an old member for a little while now that uh, participation is actually very, very important and, and membership is very important um, to Alt's ethos. So when I sent an email around to those people who are in the room now who volunteered to participate, um, I asked each of them to prepare a slide and add a slide to, um, to our deck. So I'm going to start with Martin DeGiomas, if I can. And we're going to go right to the other side of the world. Um, and let's have a look at the slide that Martin added here. Martin, are you happy to pick up the mic, or would you prefer to talk us through this on the text chat? That's fine, whatever works for you. There we go, great Thanks, to Reza. see you. Uh, can you hear me OK? Good. Yes, all good. Right. Thank you very Hi. much for joining us. Um, oh, no, look, a pleasure. Thanks for organising it, and um, it's a pleasure to, to join. It's um, very good timing, actually, because uh, uh, we've been doing Moodle for 15-odd years, and a lot of that uh, head down in our own uh, community, and uh, which is very active. That's great. And, and it's really in the last uh, year or so, or really the last few months actually, that I've been really 
very, very keen to open doors to other open pro projects and, um, and we have a lot of things sort of starting in that direction. So it was good time. And that's why I, uh, when, I, when we saw the invitation, I took it up. Uh, so uh, we have a very clear mission at Moodle, and, and this is stuff that we've only refined again um, in the last year or so. Um, so our mission is to empower educators to improve our world, and we're very focused on that, um, educators specifically. Uh, rather than saying we're trying to teach the world ourselves or that we're trying to enable everyone to learn, um, I feel and we feel that by empowering the current systems, and I think this is very important with open stuff, um, that, that, that that's how we make real changes. We, we're not, uh, I, I would hazard a guess, being first it's interesting, but uh, I would hazard a guess that a lot of us are not about replacing or disrupting or destroying existing systems, but rather improving them and helping them. Um, that's, that's really our helpful. Our vision is to give the world the most effective platform for learning. So we, we are very focused on, a, on building a platform on which other people can, um, can innovate and, and take it in a lot of different directions. And we have five values that steer that. So um, if it was just the mission and vision alone, um, somebody pointed out to me recently that uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, Nazi Germany had, I, I'm sure Nazi Germany thought they were improving the world in some way. Um, it's to, to really make that mean something, you need values behind those kind of statements. And the values are, uh, for us, are these five. Um, so we treat education as a value, we value education and we see it as a component of all interactions really, all communication. This is an education situation. Um, and that to realise that that is always there, we're always learning and we're always improving and that's kind of being open to mistakes and, and, uh, and so on. Um, the openness is a, is a value for us. As, uh, as much as anything else, that we try and be open in every level, uh, inclusive and open to uh, uh, different uh, uh, people around the world uh, and uh, different languages. Moodle, Moodle itself is very multilingual. We have a hundred plus languages. And country and uh, most of all the interesting stuff is in non-English speaking countries. Um, uh, respect uh, for all participants and stakeholders but even competitors and that's important to me that you should be Taking a kind of a high moral ground, if you like, um, and accepting that all, you know there's good things everywhere, um, but uh, that uh, that if you have that respect for people internally and externally, that you, you have better results overall. And that kind of leads to integrity and, and being ethical, um, trying to uh, follow through on things that we do, trying to. Uh, make sure that um, uh, software is in has integrity, that data has integrity, uh, and that, uh, that there's a structure that you can um, look at because it's open, and you understand that um, that it's uh, it all hangs together. And finally, innovation. Um, I think openness breeds innovation. If you're open about what you're doing and and, uh, and what your aims are, um, a lot of other people who who get that. We'll jump on board and take it further and take it in directions that, that, that you can't possibly imagine yourself. And it's, we have to work together. Uh, and, and it's you know, pretty clear that we can't save the world ourselves. So um, we've got eight major projects. And I didn't want to spend a lot of time on these. But I did want to give a flavor of what we're doing. Because in here are a lot of opportunities to work with uh, a lot of you who are here uh, and open projects in general. Um, 
So I just, if you don't mind, uh, indulge me for a minute to just go through these, maybe two. Uh, I'm going to kill the video actually, just in case that's uh, affecting the video, the audio. Um, so we have Moodle, our open source uh, software, of course, uh, which everybody knows and is uh, an education platform um, that's uh, used by schools and universities and um, workplaces. We have our clients, open source clients for accessing them uh, for mobile and now desktop. Uh, we have certified services. We have partners around the world who do services. And um, one thing about open source is that, uh, and open projects is I think they need to be extremely, they need to be sustainable. They need to be built sustainable. And to make them sustainable and not reliant on one-off grant funding and things like that, you need to build in some sort of a business model. And business doesn't need to be a dirty word. Um, believe me, uh, I'm, I, there is a lot of dirtiness in business and uh, the, the kind of Silicon Valley approach to software, this kind of profit-focused business, that is what's causing a lot of damage in the world today. But open projects need to be sustainable. They need to have business models that allow them to, be, um, to, to last. And so some of the other things we have is a Moodle Cloud. We have a SaaS platform, um, uh, which is a, an open curriculum to learn how to teach online, and that's to help people use all this stuff. Uh, we have a, a MOOC, which is for massive open online courses, um, and that's um, Moodle Academy, uh, which is uh, under development now. Um, this one is important. The, the second last one is the Moodle Community and Marketplace. This is a new social network that we want to build that actually connects all of our Moodles together, allows teachers to, to uh, communicate, to find uh, people who are working in the same area, perhaps teaching the same subject in the same language at the same level. Uh, and most importantly, um, there's, there's two bits that involve OER. So the first bit is that we plan to connect open education resources from around the uh, world into our uh, community system so that if you're looking at a, at a course and you're a teacher, you're able to very easily find that stuff and then drag and drop it straight into your course. So we want to uh, make that, that uh, usability part on top of the other OER that's around. Um, and the second thing is that we want the community to be making open education resources and making courses and sharing them. And we, we have in here um, the idea of a kind of a Kickstarter type model where a trusted member of the community steps forward and says, I'm going to make this course. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to, here's the outline of it. Here's my, um, my, my credentials to say I can do it. And uh, if other people like it, they crowd fund uh, that development. And so that person who makes it isn't doing it for free. Uh, it's a sustainable model. They can spend their weekends and earn something for it. But then the results must be Creative Commons and, and is out there in the, in the, um, for everybody to use. Uh, and lastly, uh, we're starting a Moodle Foundation, uh, which is an, a non-profit organization based in Europe. And it's going to be very focused on getting involved in the uh, EU funding, uh, which is um, uh, very compatible with Moodle. And uh, a lot of people already use Moodle in there, but they, they don't usually include our organization. Um, but we, we are going to start to get included. We want to be securing funding and promoting research around Moodle. So um, we're going to be a lot more active in Europe. Uh, I may be moving there myself in the next uh, year or two. And uh, uh, it's exciting times. And, and we really want to work with uh, um, all of you, um, and particularly open source projects, to get our integrations working much better. Because I think we're in a bit of a war here, not a bit of a war, we are in a war uh, against interests that are trying to take over uh, the internet, they're trying to take over data and privacy, they're trying to take over um, ownership of tools that you know, really should be open to all. And uh, that, that worries me extremely. And so uh, if you want to talk further about that, contact me. Thank you very much. Thanks for the time.
Thank you. Thanks so much, Martin. I don't think we could have had a better start, actually, to today's um, discussions because Moodle and the way that um, the Moodle community works is a great example, really, of, of how to be open and effective. Um, and the fact that you've sort of opened some of those cans of worms that often come up in open ed SIG discussions around um, what is open and uh, and actually to be open, particularly online, we do need money, so business models do have to be part of that discussion. Um, it, it's great to have those perspectives brought in and illustrated so well. If it weren't for the collaboration of a lot of um, people working openly, we wouldn't have Moodle. I say that as a Moodler myself with, with some years now of admin um, experience too. So I, I don't think we could have had a better start than that. Thank you so much for taking us through your plans. And I, I'm quite excited actually to see whether, Martin, we couldn't do um, an open ed SIG in-depth Moodle session like we did with Wiki, Wikipedia and Wikimedia. Um, and, and I'm sure many of us, as we'll continue to discuss in the chat as well, are, share your concerns around net neutrality and um, control of the internet by big business um, as well. So yes, those, those um, aspects are certainly shared concerns too. Um, I can see Coral has joined us as well, so Sarah, welcome, and um, we've had quite a lot of people joining us as we continue. I'm going to press on because we have a lot of organisations represented here. Um, Who is going to talk to us about Scotland, Lorna? I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be you. So, and because there are several slides here, Lorna, I'm just going to make you a moderator so that you can move through them as and when you're ready, but do um, grab the mic. Can you hear me, Teresa? Yes, I can indeed. Okay, um, I'm not actually involved in the OEPS project, so I think it would probably be Pete Cannell talking about that. Right. So, uh, do we have that person in the room? Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said very clearly there. Let me just turn my volume up. Hi, this is this is Pete. Here. Um, ah, Pete, thank you. Yeah. Hi, there's a lot, obviously a lot more to get through, so thanks for the opportunity to just say something. Um, yeah, OEPS is a, a three-year project in Scotland, um, which actually is very close to its end, and it ends in just over two weeks' time on July the 31st. So um, I and others involved with it are in kind of reflective and uh, hyperactive mode, writing things up at the moment. Um, and the particular characteristics of the project, I think, are that it's um, a project that's very much predicated on um, developing practice in education from a widening participation perspective. And it's interested in the kind of use practices that enable both learners, and we've particularly looked at kind of non-traditional adult learners, and but also organizations and institutions to engage with open education. And I think rather than it's been a very broad and diverse project, there's lots of things that we've done, you can follow some of them on the, on the website, you know, the links to, but I think if I was going to just concentrate on two things just now, I think um, one of the things we've done is devote a lot of attention to the barriers for both learners and uh, organisations in engaging with open resources and open practice. And we've um, done that in a, a variety of ways. Worked very close to a range of organisations to, to kind of work through things in practice and uh, gain insights. And I think some of what we found about that and the ways in which um, uh, people who um, are coming to open education from the point of view of actually. Uh, living in a digital world, having lots of experiences, both positive and neg negative, but actually uh, wanting and needing to get engaged, the kinds of obstacles and barriers that they, they face. And we've written quite a lot about that, and we've got a bit more to write about it yet. <coughs> I think the other thing that we've done is um, develop some interesting models of um, 
participatory and collaborative course development. One of the things we were asked to do by the um, Scottish Government and the Scottish Funding Council who funded the project at the beginning was to develop uh, a small number of exemplar of the licensed courses in which we could um, employ some of the, of the practice based ideas that the project developed. Uh, we found that there's been a really high demand for doing those things in partnership with organisations that are primarily but not entirely outside the academy and actually over the course of the project we'll have produced 14 new open badges, open, open licensed courses in a quite a wide and diverse range of topics but I think we've done one or two things that are relatively innovative in the way that we've designed those as well. I think I'll stop there because otherwise uh, if I start going into everything else we've done, I'll be here all day, so better to stop with everybody else have a chance. Thanks so much, Pete. That's great. I really appreciate Brevity is, is at the soul of it, really, because um, we could, yeah, there's so much we could talk about, and we, we've got lots and lots of people to uh, to hear from, too. But thank you so much. Scotland has been leading the way, I think, in the UK, and many times we've pointed to um, the experience within Scotland and the things that have been going on here. Open Scotland is my next slide on the deck here. Somebody Would somebody like to pick that one up? Lorna. Do you want me to take this or do you want to take it, Joe? I'm not hearing Joe, so if you can hear me, I'll go ahead with this. On you go, Sister. Um, yeah. So, Okay, so Open Scotland um, is a voluntary cross-sector initiative um, that aims to raise awareness of open education policy and practice to benefit all sectors of Scottish education. Um, the, when I say this is a voluntary project, I mean that it's, it's unfunded, um, but it has been supported by a number of organisations and institutions over the years. Um, the initiative was founded in 2013 and at that stage was funded by CETUS, uh, SQA, Jiscar, C Scotland and ALT. Um, several of the organisations that initially supported Open Scotland are no longer in existence um, and the initiative is now primarily uh, supported by Alt Scotland and by the University of Edinburgh. Um, one of the main things that um, Open Scotland does is it lobbies the Scottish Government to try to basically endorse open licences for publicly funded open educational resources. Um, to date, we haven't been successful in doing that. The Scottish Government has proved to be um, very resistant to the idea of actually engaging with open education. Other than the OEPS project, which was funded, I think, three years ago, um, that's the only block of funding that's been put into um, open education. Um, this is quite a surprising um, perspective, I think, because Scotland has always had a very diverse and inclusive approach to education. For those of you who, who aren't from the UK, the, the education systems of Scotland and England are quite different and distinct. Um, but uh, we haven't been successful in engaging the Scottish Government um, with the campaign to open licence publicly funded educational resources. We have developed the Scottish Open Education Declaration, um, which basically lays out the principles we believe are beneficial. Um, it's based on the Paris OER Declaration, and it's an open community draft. I'll put the, the link up in a second, um, which many educators from Scotland and further afield have contributed to. Interestingly, although um, we haven't been successful in engaging the Scottish Government um, with the Scottish Open Education Declaration, it has generated a lot of interest elsewhere. Um, and some of you may have seen a link that um, Javier Asenas posted in the chat window about 10 minutes ago, um, which is about a campaign um, from the Moroccan Government um, who are looking to endorse a version of the declaration. Um, so we are going to keep pushing this with the Scottish Government. Um, we've got, I think, quite a lot of momentum behind us, and I hope that um, we will be able to make some impact later, if not sooner. Um, so I'll pass over to Joe next, because Joe has been engaging with um, several um, international open education policy initiatives on behalf of Open Scotland. So over to you, Joe. Okay. Hi there. Hope you can hope you can hear me. Uh, 
I think I think that the first thing about lack of engagement with the Scottish Government, we actually have been engaging with the Scottish Government. We just haven't been getting the the, the answers that we kind of expected from them. Uh, the, the, the kind of policy view in Scottish Government still is that open education isn't something that's all embracing that spans universities, colleges, schools, community learning, the, the, the whole gamut. That, that in fact, uh, open education is reflected in things like the MOOCs that the universities produce, uh, and, I, I, and it's, it, it's still really a, a, a social responsible thing that universities can choose to engage with, uh, and it's not really the Scottish Government's job to, uh, to, to, to interfere in any of this. So, so, so we have had feedback from them, it's just not been the kind of feedback that we, we, we anticipated. Uh, oh, and, and Lona wants to jump back in with one last point, so I'll, I'll let her jump in with one last point for talk about the international dimension. Um, one thing that I should add is that um, ScotGov have been very active in getting behind the Open Government Partnership, um, and that is another area that we're hoping to um, try and engage ministers, um, certainly getting behind opening up access to public um, and government data, particularly financial data is a real driver in ScotGov at the moment um, and I've certainly been talking to some of the people involved in the Open Government Partnership in the hope that they can sort of um, start to, to, to push um, the idea of open education as well through these channels. So as Joe said, it's not so much that um, Scott Government are completely sort of blanking the idea of open education, it's just that their attention is <laughs> unsurprisingly quite often in different places. And, and I suppose just 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 to round off on on this, uh, and, and thanks a lot of Lorna's work actually. The, the open the open Scottish Open Education Declaration really has garnered support not just around Europe but around the around the world. Lots of people actually assume it's Scottish government policy, uh, and 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 where I think where I hope we'll get to uh, following uh, the Ljubljana event in, in in September is we're going to have lots more evidence to take back to Scottish government, uh, re really to stop them hanging about and to really to get them to adopt the Scottish Open Education Declaration. Uh, the, the evidence is that what's going to come out from uh, from from UNESCO in September is it, it's really a I see these as very sensible things, uh, which which I'll actually I'll, I'll I'll add a YouTube clip that, that, that summarises the things that are coming out of the consultations, and you all you can all see them. And that, that that means we can move on to the next speaker. Okay, I'll shut up at that. Thanks so much. That was a great tag team effort from Scotland, and and great to have your representation there. I, I can feel your frustration, but please don't give up. You're a great team and you've done some fabulous stuff and, and just as um, uh, Josie broke through in, uh, in Leicestershire with policy, I'm sure um, things will break through in Scotland too. Um, and I can say that with pride because I'm married to a Scot, so you know, <laughs> that counts too. Um, the Open Recognition Alliance, je crois qu'on a Serge Ravé, alors Serge, uh, is Serge there? Would you like to uh, talk a little bit? Yes, can you hear me? To the Serge, great, lovely. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, bonjour. Bonjour tout le monde. Depuis from the 14th of July, best day in France. Of course. Mm -hmm. yes. What a significant date to have you with us too. Well, it's a, it's a great day because it was a freedom for France and uh, we also want the freedom of education. So I think it's uh, very apt there to speak about open recognition. Absolutely. Um, so, a few words about open recognition. Um, you, I've been working with open badges for a long time now. And there was open, um, there was a badge alliance, and then when the badges, open badges were handed over to INS, at least the standard was handed over to INS Global, uh, there was no more open community, and uh, as we had the conference in Bologna, uh, the EPIC conference in Bologna last year, we decided, it was a bit cheeky, but we decided to uh, remix the Bologna Declaration of 99, and uh, collect, 
the Open Recognition Declaration. Uh, because what we've done with Open Badges is there is, we now have the tools to build an open architecture for recognition, and recognition is absolutely central to education. It's fine to have open resources. It's fine to have open software. It's fine to have open learning. But at the end, the recognition of this learning is very important. And so, uh, while the first Bologna Declaration was about uh, creating uh, an open space for more well, space for higher education, where we'd be able to exchange credits, but the idea of the Bologna Open Recognition Declaration is to open recognition to all forms of learning. Uh, and also, I think one point that most people miss when we speak about recognition of learning, uh, it's always implied that it is a formal recognition of learning. Uh, it's true that open badges have been, ve have been very good at promoting the recognition of informal learning, but there is one form of recognition which is not yet visible, not yet accepted, uh, accepted which is the informal recognition. And I think we, with the technology, we have the possibility to make individuals not just begging recognition from others, but to make everybody the builder, the co-constructors of re recognition space. Uh, and so this is the idea of empowering individuals to be the active contributors to a culture of recognition and trust. And also, thinking when we speak about recognition, recognition is often centered on, uh, make reference to the past. Basically, you have a qualification, uh, you have a diploma, a certificate, and these certificates tell you what you have done in the past, and probably from that you can infer what the person will be able to do in the future. Uh, uh, the recognition comes post facto, comes after learning. I believe, and a number of other people in the Open Recognition Alliance believe that recognition should be at the center of learning. Not at the end, uh, but it should be at the center, and learning starts with recognition. And thinking in those terms, that is, to make the individuals the co-constructor of a culture of recognition, I think it's a way to create, ultimately, an open society, and this is the goal uh, of the Open uh, Recognition Alliance. That was not full, but here it is. Thank you so much, Serge. I think this is it's really important to have you here today and to, to have this aspect. And I, I'm so glad that you mentioned the trust word because I think that is probably the most important. Those of us who are um, working within institutions, um, we're beset by challenges of competition um, and uh, each trying to outdo the other. Um, and the great thing about open education and belief in open education is actually that we need to trust each other and that we need to uh, work collaboratively, certainly from an education practitioner perspective too. Um, Serge's work with EU Portfolio as well, you may be aware of. Please do connect with Serge if um, you've not uh, come across the work of Open Recognition Alliance and Open Badges. Um, Doug Belshaw was going to join us today. He was to do quite a lot of work with Mozilla on open badges, um, but unfortunately can't because he's busy with, uh, uh, we are co-op at the moment, um, but I'm sure he'll catch up on the, uh, on the recording and uh, there'll be many of you I know within the room who have used open badges in various ways for CPD um, and for initiatives within your institution, so great to have your input. Thank you very much, Serge. Um, open Education Working Group, we have you next. We have some great badge fans in the room as well, Deb. <laughs> Good to see you there. Um, now, do we have someone who wishes to speak to this? If so, just grab the mic. Hi, this is us. Ah, great. OK, uh, thank you. <laughs> hi. Uh, thank you for organizing this. Fantastic. Uh, I'm Javiera. Um, 
Well, the Open Education Working Group is uh, one of the branches of the uh, Open Knowledge International. We have, uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, we have a great bunch of people working with us. We have a new uh, board, so thanks for everyone that just joined the board. But we have a clear commitment. Uh, we promote open educational practices, but also open data, open policies, and open science. In, in our team, uh, fortunately, she's on the beach now. Um, she couldn't join us, Annalisa. She deals with the open science beat, uh, which, is, which is great. And I mostly do open policies and open data. And Paul Backstage deals with the open educational practices and open policies. He's one of the most uh, wise people uh, around, around our sector and in open policies. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, she's on the beach. No, she said, oh, unfortunately, cannot join. I'm on the beach. Okay, come on. Um, so, yeah, that's what we do. We collaborate with a large, large range of projects, which is one of these is open net. Um, and we have a new charter because we've changed the conditions of participation, which were a bit of outdated. So please see our charter, see if you can join us. Um, later on, I'm going to post some, some um, uh, more links in the forum. Uh, because we have an open forum for everyone, which is searchable. So if you want to deposit your uh, research, for example, you can, you're welcome to do it. And um, yeah, we, we have a, some interesting projects coming ahead. We published a book on use of open data, open educational resources with Yo Haveman. Um, what else? Uh, we are supporting other initiatives. So if you need our support, please feel free to contact us. And yeah, that's, that's it for me. Anyone has a question? Or Lorna, do you want to talk about the, um, the new board? What are you doing, guys? Hello? Sorry, I'd hidden, I'd hidden the, um, the microphone under the chat panel. Hi, um, Lorna. Do you sorry, Ben? <laughs> um, I've been involved in the um, Open Education Working Group since its inception um, quite a number of years ago now. and. Um, I think it's really great to see the new board um, reinvigorating um, the, open, uh, the Open Knowledge Network, Open Education Working Group. Um, I know that um, some of the past activities of the group, um, particularly the, um, the, the work around open data, which Javier mentioned, have been really influential. Um, and we have a, a thoroughly international um, board um, steering the work going forward. Um, so hopefully we're going to be able to link up with some other really interesting initiatives that are going on, like Open Scotland, like the Open Med project as well. Um, so it's certainly really interesting times um, for the, the Open Knowledge, Open Education Working Group. And I think it provides a really um, important international umbrella that we can all work. Um, we all have our own initiatives going on, but I think this, this acts as a really interesting, a really useful hub uh, to bring us all together. So I'd really encourage everyone to have a look at the work of the group. Thanks, Lorna. I'm, I'm going to press on because we've still got a few people to get through before we do our activity together. So um, go GN here if we can uh, invite Martin perhaps. To Martin Weller to, to uh, say a few words to this? Uh, yeah, it was going to be Bayer, but uh, Bayer's been pulled in some oh, way. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, no, 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 yeah. So it's, it's me. Oh, can't make um, it. So uh, the GoGN is a, a global network of uh, PhD students who are researching OER, so funded by the Hewlett Foundation. Um, I think we've got at least one of them here. Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Um, and partly what, um, what they wanted to do was to try and raise the profile of uh, OER research, kind of make it a, a research field, as it were. But also, um, often we find that people who are doing OER research are often the only person in their institution who have got a vague interest in openness or OER. And, and any, often even their supervisors aren't really from the area. So it's a way of kind of providing them with a, a, a sort of global network. Uh, and what we do is we bring them, um, a bunch of them, so people apply, so people can join. I think we've got about 40 odd. Uh, members. So every year we bring about 10 or so to the uh, OE Global Conference and we run a two-day seminar beforehand where we get them to uh, present about the research and give them feedback and we offer advice um, 
on methodology or concepts and stuff, and that's really useful for them. I think just I think the, the most useful part is they get to talk to other people, and often they've gone off to form kind of like little subgroups around particular methodologies or whatever. Um, and then we have some open sessions, and then uh, a number of them will then present at the conference. So we were in Cape Town this year, uh, and we also run um, a monthly webinar uh, where we get speakers to come in and talk about aspects of. Uh, of, of OER and open education, uh, so sign up for that. It's the first Wednesday of every month, um, and we offer kind of other bits of support as well. So sometimes someone will say, "Can someone have a look at a, uh, an abstract I'm preparing, or can anyone help me on um, a proposal I'm putting together?" So it will be kind of create a, a global community. And it's been really successful, actually. I'm, I'm sure uh, Catherine uh, would would agree that certainly the uh, Cape Town uh, conference this year was really good and really useful for a lot of people. I've just, I'm just going to stick a little video in the uh, chat there so you can go and see uh, the various students talking about how wonderful uh, GoGen is. And I'll leave it there. That's great. Thanks, Martin. I'm sorry to rush people, but we've got a few slides through here. So I think we've, we've mentioned, so this is a sort of combination slide of... of uh, this is, this is me again. Yeah, so, you again. <laughs> so after, having quit, after having told Lorna no double dipping, I'm now double dipping. So, I, I, so I'm talking about the OER hub here. Um, so uh, the OER hub is uh, uh, so it's me, uh, Beck, Pitt, Rob Farrow, Bayer de Arcos, and Nash Eggleston. So it's a research team at the Open University, and we run a, a portfolio of um, uh, OER projects, research projects, and we're really interested in kind of the impact of, of OER. So it started from a Hewlett-funded project, the OER Research Hub, which had kind of 13 different hypotheses about the benefits and impact of OER, and we worked with 15 different collaborations looking for evidence around those. Uh, but since then, we've kind of made it a, a, a bigger team, so funded by a number of different projects. So uh, we've mentioned some of them, so OOPS has been mentioned, so Beck worked on that, uh, GoGN, which is mainly Bayer. Uh, Rob works on the OER world map, which is um, uh, so we're just a partner there. So it's mainly done by HPZ in Germany, where they're plotting, they're putting together all, um, OER resources, projects, and, and people. Uh, we run a, an Erasmus project called BizMOOC, BizMOOC which is developing um, MOOCs for uh, business and uh, professional development. And we've just started a very exciting project, UK Open Textbook. So uh, Hewlett funding again. Um, and uh, where we're looking at, we're taking the, the open textbook approach from the US, so particularly working with people like uh, OpenStax and Open Textbook Network, and seeing whether that is transferable to the UK. So if you're interested in open textbooks, uh, come and look at us there. I've just realized I'm actually wearing the same T-shirt that I'm wearing at the photo. I do change T-shirts. but uh, Yeah, so uh, OER Hub is a conglomeration of different projects. We, so if you're interested in open education research and uh, OER impact, then uh, come speak to us. Lovely. Thanks very much, Martin. We've got Open Med now. I haven't managed to flick back through the room participants to see if we've got. Uh, yes, Hello. I think we Hello. do indeed. We have. Hello. Um, Christina. Hello, this is Christina, yes, from, from Open Med. Um, thank you very much for having organized this conversation, which is very inspiring, and also thanks to all the participants. Um, this is OpenMed. I work at UNIMED. UNIMED is uh, a Mediterranean Universities Union. It is a network of uh, universities in Europe and in the South Mediterranean countries aimed at supporting and fostering academic cooperation among um, the Mediterranean countries. So our focus is not exactly an, on open education. Uh, however, we are leading this project as a way for us to, um, to support the academic cooperation across Europe and the South Mediterranean countries. So, Open Med stands for Opening Up Education in South Mediterranean countries, and it's a three-year project co-funded by the Erasmus Plus Capability in Higher Education program of the European Union. This means that the project is not for life, so it's not a, an initiative for life. We will work together for three years. Uh, supporting educators in uh, the South Mediterranean countries to um, implement open education in, in their context. That's great, have, thank you. Sorry, Christina, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Do you have something else you want to add? 
Well, I just want to mention uh, one of, um, of of the collaboration that we are already having with uh, with this community. Um, we well, Javiera is the external evaluator of OpenMail and advisor, so she is supporting very much uh, the project. And, and most importantly, we, are, we have now launched this petition to support open education in Morocco, which is uh, inspired by Lorna and the Open Scotland Declaration. So I want to thank also Lorna for her availability and, and inspiration for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. And, and you make a great point there about the cross-fertilization that is happening naturally because a lot of these um, projects which are very focused on um, making a difference within our communities um, and, and very time consuming and uh, run and organized with a good deal of passion, um, we take support from each other in the open. So it's great to emphasize that is so important. Um, and that we recognize each other's contribution and that we get inspiration and ideas from each other. I'm going across to the US now. Um, and uh, Coral is very close to my heart as a linguist because the work there at the University of Texas, uh, at Aust Austin, Texas, um, is very much around open educational resources and working in the open for language teaching and learning. Um, so having a quick scan through, who is uh, hear from Carl. I think it's... Hi, it's Sarah. Sarah, mm -hmm. thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, well, thanks for having us. So Coral is, as you said, at the University of Texas at Austin, but um, we're funded by the Department of Education. So uh, we work with faculty at the University of Texas, but then we serve the entire country. Um, and so we create materials for language learning, and they're all open. Um, and then we also do professional development. And so one of our main goals is to provide materials for people, but then also at the same time teach them about openness. So um, our, our main objective is just to provide language learning materials, but um, we're hoping to slip in the message about openness to language teachers. and. Um, encourage them to share with each other and to create their own materials. Uh, so, we're, so we're really focused on open practices as well as open materials. Um, and I think, yes, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. So we have about 11 or 12 projects we're working on right now with different languages. Um, we have already materials in 16 languages. And uh, so we're just trying to spread openness through language learning. Thank you, Sarah. And I, and I want to sort of emphasize as a language practitioner just how important this is because um, language delivery and language teaching is highly commodified. And, and therefore, from, from a practitioner's perspective, some of this is actually uh, very difficult to um, empower teachers because often the curriculum is controlled um, and your uh, delivery mechanism rather than uh, somebody who can truly interact and create resources with and for students. Um, and Coral have done a great job in actually exemplifying how the digital can be used um, in order to empower teachers and make teaching sustainable. Um, I sort of kind of return to Martin's point at the very beginning um, here about wanting to improve uh, the world and not replace teachers with robots. <laughs> and Carl gave a really good example of how um, language teaching really relies on people and, and um, interaction and how important it is to use the digital to support that. So thank you very much, Sarah. That's, uh, that's great. We're going to come to Spark next. And Nicole, I think you're there for Spark. Um, hi, I'm Nicole Allen, Director of Open Education for Spark. Uh, we're a global coalition that works to make open the default way for sharing information in research and education. Uh, we're a membership organization of mostly academic research and research libraries, um, primarily in the US and Canada, uh, but we also have regional affiliates in uh, Europe, Africa, and Japan. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Spark uh, Europe. So we work across openness um, in terms of open access, open education, and open data. 
And our work uh, consists of, of three kind of prongs. So the first is policy, which is probably what we're best known for, um, mostly in the U.S., uh, promoting open access to research output and open licensing of publicly funded educational resources. Uh, but we also do some international work through the Open Government Partnership. Um, we also do education and professional development uh, for libraries to implement open policies and practices on campus and incubate projects uh, like the Open Access Button. Um, we also have a student program called Open Tom, uh, which is about empowering the next generation of leaders um, where students are early in their careers uh, to kind of drive change toward openness. Um, and we're currently in the process of our, our application process for this year's conference, and there's more information there. Um, and I'll just note that as an organization that uh, works across several open areas, we've had um, kind of the, an interesting experience of adding open education as an issue area um, and learning how open maybe means something a little bit different for education than it does in research. Um, you know, if we're talking about languages, it might just be that it's a different language but the same branch. But the thing that we've kind of settled on is, you know, first that open has a clear meaning of free plus free use rights. Um, and that when we talk about open, it's not about open, it's about open in order to, open in order to improve society, to accelerate research, to help people learn better. So that's it. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much for, uh, for whizzing through that. As you can see, our time is getting, uh, is somewhat limited, so I'm going to press on. But the, the, we've saved uh, Geo for All here as our final slide. And Suchit has done an in-depth um, webinar for the Open Ed SIG, which you can find on our um, playlist on the Association for Learning Technology YouTube channel. So um, this really was one of the most inspirational webinars that I've had the pleasure to, um, uh, to pull together, which was a, a, really sort of making very clear the connection between openness and making a difference to the world. So, so Chief, I'm hoping that your technical problems have, have disappeared and you'll be able to quickly <laughs> talk us through yeah. this. Thank you very much, Teresa, and thank you, everyone, uh, for all your, uh, your presentations. I was really happy to hear all these different perspectives on openness. And uh, I want to send our greetings on behalf of the geo for all community. And we are uh, the Open Education Initiative of the Open Source Geospatial Foundation. And we believe that access to quality education is everyone's birthright. And thanks to digital technologies, we now have that opportunity to make that possible. And open principles in science and education are key for this. And so by open principles, we mean the whole uh, spectrum from open source software, open access to research publication, open educational resources, open data, open standards, all coming together. So I want to move to my next slide. Uh, so yeah, I put this uh, image because, um, in fact, when this image was taken, it's much older than me. It was I was not even born uh, when this image was taken. But this image, I, I, when I, I saw this first time when I was around 10 years old, when I, uh, when I was a school kid in uh, India at that time, I went to a science fair, and I still remember this image from that uh, from that uh, days. Because this is, this is one of the images you will never forget once you see it. Uh, and for me, when I look back, you know, when this image was taken, we were around 3.5 billion people at that time. But now, you know, we have around 7.5 billion people on this planet. But still, in spite of all these technological advancements, it's a sad fact that majority of the world's poorest do not still have access to basic facilities. And I mean, you know, clean drinking water, sanitation and hygiene facilities, good quality education resources. And for me, you know, openness is fundamental to this. And I'm giving you one example. For example, uh, for, from uh, agriculture and nutrition, you know, one of the things we believe is, you know, open data in agriculture and nutrition is fundamental to make uh, the 800 million people who are still struggling from deliberating hunger and nutri malnutrition to, ha to make sure by 2030 we have, we, we achieve the UN um, sustainable development goals. So for us, you know, openness is not just something uh, abstract, it is something fundamental to, you know, what we have to do now to make these changes happening. And that's what at Geo for All we do uh, at, at every day. So my next slide is on why openness is important. So, uh, you know, it is over one year since the United Nations launched the SDG 2030. And it is a, a universal call to action to end poverty, 
protect the planet and ensure all people enjoy peace and prosperity. The SDGs work in the spirit of partnership and pragmatism to make the right choices now to improve life in a sustainable way for our future generations. The SDGs are an inclusive agenda and they tackle the root causes of poverty and unite us together to make a positive change to both people and the planet. And for me, the openness is fundamental to all achieving all these 17 fundamental goals. You know, so without that, you know, we cannot make this happen. And that's what at Geo for All, what we do is to make sure, you know, we work together, you know, to bring together all these ideas and make this possible. And uh, service for the betterment of humanity is the key fundamental principles, principle of Geo for All, and we want to contribute and focus our efforts for the UN SDGs. And when I showed you that image from uh, the image that was Earth Rise with that the uh, astronauts from Apollo 8 took in 1968, you know, I, I'm thinking now, you know, my, I have a son who is seven year old, you know, when he's around 30 years old, and when he looks back to this same image, you know, our Earth will have changed dramatically. And, you know, we have a responsibility to make sure, you know, we make sure, you know, these 800 million people who have, don't have even, you know, food and uh, basic facilities, you know, this has to change. And that's for me, that's the fundamental thing of what openness. You know, totally, we can only do with, not by governments alone, we have to make sure we bring everyone together, use our available knowledge and resources to make this happen. And that's all from my perspective. So thank you very much, Teresa, for uh, this opportunity given to us. Thank you, Sachit, and thanks for making that case so clearly. Um, I think it's really, <laughs> yes, and thanks, James, for inviting me to travel back in time. Now, this is true. OE Global 2018 is next on our list. Um, I'm, I'm just going to remind people that if you come to the uh, file link at the top left-hand corner of your screen and come to save, you can save the chat. And there's been lots and lots of really useful exchanges going on in the chat, so uh, uh, certainly worth revisiting that. Um, we have an activity that I'm going to ask everybody to do next, so just to give you a chance to um, uh, wake up your typing fingers, um, let's just focus on these words here from Gandhi. Um, when I was thinking about values, I was thinking, okay, well, surely organizations start with their values and then they sort of turn that into action, they operationalize their values. Um, and, and, and I had that sort of totally thrown on its head, really, when I read this. Um, but what it made very clear to me is how close and how important it is that actually what we do is connected to what we value and how, in fact, our messages, the messages that we transmit through what we do, sometimes betray that we're not totally aligned with our values. Um, I, I think, it, Joe, I'm with you. It, it, for me, it's totally humbling. And you kind of, when you read your way through this, you kind of think, OK, well, I, did, I made that decision. I made that. I, I did. I, this has become my habit. Is that connected to my values in some way? I think it's really quite a useful um, activity to do to kind of uh, think about how aligned we are uh, with our values in terms of what we do. Um, so there's a very quick Mentimeter activity that I'm going to ask you to uh, to take part in here. So in order to do this, let me just give you a link in the chat. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do first is just to show you this through the board. So let me just move to the web tour and put this into the whiteboard. So you should now be seeing, um, first of all, a Padlet that Deb, who's in the room and a, a GoGN researcher uh, doing a PhD at the moment, um, created and set up that many of you have shared your um, organizations with. So this Padlet pulls together the many, many faces of Open, and I'm sure there'll be even more that are still there. So please, um, if you don't already know many of the uh, organizations represented here, please do connect with them uh, and follow that up and uh, make sure that you're represented here. I'm going to just swap that now for another one. This is um, just a, a shot, this is a local shot at Warwick. I've been involved in a, in a um, 
uh, an activity here where we're trying to get people to engage with open practice um, within my institution. And we took the metaphor of wildflowers. Well, if you, if you think of wildflowers as being the stuff that your organization does and supports, um, uh, Deb, perhaps you can pop the Padlet link in there for Martin in the chat. Um, the, uh, the, the image for me really represents just how what we do also has to tie up with where we're going and how important it is really to have our values aligned uh, with our actions. Um, so to finish off, I'm just going to ask everybody to go to menti.com. So let's just put that link into the chat. And what you're going to need here is a code. And that code is the number 350444, which I'm going to put in the chat there as well. And it'll take you not only to that um, initial image that I just shared with you, but then if you move on through that to a slide, and I'm going to put the, it's a word cloud slide, and I'm going to ask you to give three words that come to your mind when you think about your organization and open, the three values that you think, if you had to bring it down to three things, what are the three crucial things that your organization values? Um, and we're going to do a bit of a linguistic exploration here to see what actually um, comes up and to see exactly uh, what our word cloud generates and I will then be able to share it with you. So if you can, here we go, I can see it starting to come in. Let me just grab this and see what's coming up in our word cloud. <laughs> Excellent, and we can see it growing and changing. I'm going to just share this with you so that you can see it too, if you're not seeing it already. There we go. Right. Excuse me while I do a bit of fiddling in the background. And let's just pop this into our web tool. So you should now see some of the keywords that we think are vital. And I think this is a discussion that we need to keep going because these things take a lot of um, thinking about and maybe some of these are uh, quite complex constructs, in fact, that need uh, greater um, thought and uh, exploration and also we're coming to it from lots of different languages as well in terms of mother tongues so it'd be interesting to know just how these things come together but good to see obviously the word open right in the middle and ethics in the trust collaboration transparency these are great words to have coming in here cost control that's interesting isn't it because that yeah that's all part of your business model it has to be there we don't have endless resources unfortunately yeah, yeah, Chris, the word, it doesn't have to include the word open, but the values that are core values um, to your practice or that you, that you feel are particularly important to your organization. Um, we'll keep this going and we'll share it as well on, um, on social media. And we're using, thanks for continuing the discussions as well in the text chat. Our time is about up, and I'm sorry it's, it's hurried, but we've had such great collaboration and input. It would have been great to have Wikipedia here as well. I can see Martin is here, actually. Martin, if there's um, anything you want to add, uh, Martin Poulter, there to the discussions, please grab the mic and, and speak to us. It'd be good to have Wikimedia represented as well as a great form of open knowledge and uh, contribution to the open community uh, that also has multiple facets um, of activity and again has had um, a great impact through your um, open uh, open head SIG webinar um, 
Ah, your mic switched off. Okay, let's see if I can. Uh, it shouldn't be, so let's see if we can. Yeah, it's not saying it is, so let's just try unblocking that if possible. Great. Okay. Well, good to see that coming together. I'm hoping that now you've met each other, if you haven't met before virtually, and now you've heard each other's voices as well, we can work together on making sure that we are communicating some essential core values to the, around the word open that uh, are understood and perhaps um, interpreted in a meaningful and positive way by the wider community. And Chris, thank you so much for doing that Storyfy. That's great. What do we value? We value, we, we value from the looks of things, the way that word cloud is going at the moment, collaboration. So let's, let's live by those words and make sure um, that our actions uh, speak of uh, exactly that. Um, Thank you so much for your participation, everybody, today. Um, do feel free to put things in the chat, but um, I'm really grateful for your time over lunchtime. I do hope you still manage to get some lunch. Big thanks to everybody. I'm going to switch the recording off now. And uh, we, we will continue the conversation, obviously, through social media. And those hashtags, OpenEdSig and values, um, and make sure that we're all um,